Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is James Mancini. I'm one of the original founders of Netrio. And today we're going to be talking about several ways that you can leverage your network and systems management data to improve data security without having to increase budgets. All of the attendees are in uh, muted mode. Uh, so if you think of any questions during the presentation, please make sure to enter them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar interface. And we'll make sure to go ahead and get those answered for you right away. So why should we bother anyway? I mean, we already have a ton of existing security tools. Why do we need more? So your network and systems management platform can't and really shouldn't replace your SIEM or your IDS or your IPS. But there are some really good reasons that we should take the trouble to be able to do this. So leveraging the existing tools to get this functionality means that we can improve our security posture without spending more money, which in and of itself is no small feat. But it also can save us quite a bit of training, maintenance, and administrative overhead, which means it also comes without a big increase in labor burden. It can also give you some perspectives that many security platforms lack on their own or that are very difficult or expensive to get. I mean, sure, some of the things we're going to talk about are things that your IDS might uh, be able to do or your SAM might be doing. Um, but for example, in the case of your IDS, is it watching every single port in the environment? In a lot of cases, that's a much more expensive implementation to say nothing of all the extra overhead and bandwidth that that can, can uh, create. Now, another benefit that people often don't think of is that integrating security functionality into your overall management platform can go a long way towards improving overall security awareness in the environment and in your command center. And this can reduce the time required to respond to security incidents um, as well by increasing visibility across multiple teams. And this is especially effective if you integrate your SAEM, IDS, and IPS alerts directly back into the main command center console. So our platform provides some very simple web-based APIs to make that really easy to do. One of the best ways to leverage all this performance telemetry that we're already collecting uh, is to look for unusual behavior in the network traffic. Now, for monitoring down to the individual switch port level, which we always recommend, um, we've got very granular data that can be used to spot things like changes in behavior by a system or by a user. So a sudden spike in traffic, for example, it can be used as an easy way to spot an infected system or one that's starting to perform network scans or other kinds of reconnaissance in the environment. Um, to make sure we don't miss anything, we want to make sure that we're monitoring all of the access switch ports as well as the server switch ports. And this lets us keep an eye on end user systems without the overhead and hassle of installing endpoint monitoring software on every end user system. And it can even help find issues that endpoint monitoring might be might miss. So, for example, if the intruder can disable or evade the software, um, you know, we're kind of watching it from a different perspective. So it's sort of the belt and suspenders uh, approach to make sure that we've got duplicate monitoring so nothing gets missed. Now, looking for sudden spikes in inbound traffic from the perspective of the switch, um, so things coming from the servers or coming from the users, is a great way to find the source of this kind of traffic. And we can even track it across multiple switches, routers, or firewalls if we have to because of all this data that we've collected. And of course, a long-term change in overall traffic levels or a big jump in background traffic levels is a clear indication that the system is now being used differently. So the question then becomes if this change in behavior is explainable or not. Um, you know, we have one customer who used this method to discover that one of his IT staff had begun running backups of their database to his local hard drives. Um, you better believe that they had a good talk with him about proper backup process and data security after that. But in order to find this unusual behavior, we need to have a way to spot it without having to constantly generate manual baselines. After all, that big spike in traffic on the first of the month might be totally normal for that system. So just setting a static alert is either not going to find it or it's going to send a ton of false alarms, which will then be promptly ignored. So we need to be a little bit smarter about it to make sure that this is effective without creating a lot of extra work. The approach that we use is what we call our anomaly detection technology. So this is how we solve this problem. Because we keep all of the high resolution telemetry data and statistics uh, for all of the different uh, ports that we're monitoring, for all of the different statistics that we're monitoring, CPU processes, et cetera, we can leverage that to automatically generate a baseline behavior model. And then we can compare that model to what's happening right now. 
So we kind of get an idea for what's normal for this time of day or this day of the week or um, you know, even hour by hour. And then you can set the sensitivity of that detection to high, medium, or low, depending on your tolerances and in the environment and what the usual range of that statistic is, you can kind of fine tune this process. But that information can then be used to detect when something unusual is happening. And we can flag that an anomaly um, that can then generate alerts or reports. So we can flag those unusual behaviors and you can actually get notified about them in real time, or you can push that um, alert to your SIEM, for example, for later, later analysis if you don't want to get interrupted in real time by it. Of course, we can also run through this data on demand manually. So let me just do a quick demonstration to show you one quick way to look for this kind of unusual traffic using what we call a top talkers report. So we're going to run up to the reports menu here and I'm going to pull down the top talkers report and then it's going to ask me what we want to run this on. So I'm going to run it on a single device, in this case uh, one of our core switches. Let me find them here, okay, and then um, it's going to ask me what statistic I want to run that report on. So in this case I'm going to look for bandwidth uh, and I'm going to look for inbound bandwidth because I want to find the source of any of these kind of issues. So it's going to generate that prototype report and then I'm going to change the way that report looks so it's a little bit more accurate for me. So I'm going to go to the peak for the last 30 days and I'm going to change it to a stacked histogram because that format tends to highlight things that are different. So now it's going to take a second to go through the database in real time and generate this report. And I can go in here and turn off the background traffic from my uplink port, for example, and see here I've got a big spike in traffic from one particular port at a particular date and time. So now I've got a place I can go look to see what's plugged into that port, um, you know, who's using it, what they might have been doing during that time. And then with just a couple of more clicks, if I want to, I can also automate and schedule this report so it runs, um, you know, on a regular basis and emails the output to me so I can keep an eye on it if I don't want to get those real-time alerts. Now, we also want to watch what's happening between the devices. So in addition to looking for anomalies and overall bandwidth, you can also use that same technology to monitor network layer constructs like quality of service and VRF instances. So in addition to helping find possible security issues, this also extends your visibility into finding things like QoS misconfigurations where you might be sending traffic into the wrong queue, um, but it also allows you to find traffic that's being uh, misrouted across the wrong VRF. That can be a security problem even if it's not the result of an active intrusion. It also gives you another place to look for unusual traffic, uh, especially if it's coming from uh, multiple separate sources. Um, you might be able to spot that within a particular VRF surging in traffic or a particular um, QoS class surging in traffic and use that data to then find out where that traffic is coming from and what it consists of. Now, another way to leverage that technology is to use it at the process level. So OmniCenter is already watching every running process on every monitored system, and it's recording CPU usage, memory usage, and total number of processes for each of those uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we can extend the anomaly detection to that level and this can be extremely helpful in finding issues. So one of the obvious things to monitor here then is the total number of running processes or new running processes. So if I can get notified as soon as a new process appears on a system, this can be a great indicator that I need to go digging in and see what's going on, especially if the current IDS or IPS system isn't extended into the server OS level, which a lot of companies can't really afford. Sometimes the IDS doesn't think it's a problem uh, as well. So for example, if the server suddenly starts running a web browser or an installer, not all IDS software would flag that as a problem, but we might know, you know that server should not be installing any software or there should never be a user running a web browser directly on that system. So you can also watch for things like sudden changes in CPU or memory usage by an existing process. So this is a good idea for performance reasons anyway, um, but for example, if there's a spike in the SQL CPU usage beyond what's normal for that time of day on that day of the week, it might indicate a surge in login attempts um, that might be related to a security problem. So it can give us another thing that we need to go investigate. You should also be looking for other kinds of process behavior anomalies. For example, the number of database queries or locks uh, or number of logged in users. Any kind of unusual activity there could be a potential security issue that you'd want to investigate. So just as a quick example, we also build in a forensics report that makes finding unusual process behavior easy, even if you haven't uh, turned on anomaly detection to do it automatically. So. I'm going to drill into the dashboard of one of the Windows servers here. Um, 
So I'm gonna go look at my Active Directory server and see what's going on with him. Now I'm gonna to go to the performance tab because I wanna go look to see what's happening with his process load. And under utilization by process, I can get a list of those processes and see how they're currently doing and if anything is exceeded or not okay. But by clicking that forensics report button, it's gonna take me to a top 10 processes by CPU and memory over the last week. And I can quickly go into this report and see that there's a big spike in activity at a particular date and time. So I can zoom in on that and see, in this case, it was a PowerShell process. So now I've got a place to go look to say, okay, I can check the logs to see who was logging into that system with PowerShell at a particular time and what exactly they were doing on that system if it was an authorized behavior or not. So these sorts of reports um, can be used to really call attention to those kinds of problems uh, and allow you to spot them really easily. Now the third thing that we can do is to monitor logging anomalies. Now, this is something that often the SIEM uh, kind of controls, uh, but there are some things that we can do here that might help to supplement what you're doing there using our anomaly detection technology, because watching every single possible log message and trying to flag the ones that might mean there's a problem is usually too noisy and difficult to do well. Um, even SIEMs have trouble with this sometimes. So, um, you know, it's already doing all of the firewall log processing, for example, and looking for any anomalies there, but the system logs uh, can be really burdensome to kind of go through. So what we do is we watch for anomalies in the volume of the messages itself. So by looking for statistical anomalies in the log, like sudden spikes in the total volume of logs produced, um, this can indicate all kinds of problems, including security issues, brute force attacks, uh, or even just software bugs causing problems. But since we're watching the number of log messages as well as the type, this gives us an interesting perspective to look for unusual behaviors. Uh, and of course, you can still drill into the log messages themselves in order to troubleshoot or do forensics once the system has flagged an anomaly. But this is a great way to be able to draw your attention to systems that are potentially having some kind of issue um, you know, without having to sort through tons and tons and tons of background noise log messages. You can also create rules that filter the log messages that we're monitoring. So uh, in our system, you can create a rule and any log that matches that rule will get counted for statistics. So we can have a total log messages counter, we can have a login failure messages uh, counter or something like that if we want to. And we can look for unusual behaviors in those as well as set static thresholds on them. And again, send those alarms out uh, as needed. So the thing about using static thresholds for these uh, problems, you can use them to find when things go completely off the rails, um, but anomalies are easier to tune because they tune themselves automatically. So for example, if an application has a big spike of logins every Monday morning, but almost none on Friday, um, creating a static alert isn't gonna work very well because if there's a spike on a Friday due to a compromised credential, um, but it's below the level that Monday's spike normally is, that might not flag a static threshold that doesn't change, uh, but an anomaly threshold would spot that as being unusual for that particular day of the week or that particular time of the day. Uh, and that would give us a place to go look to see what's happening. Um, some of our customers have even used this technology to do things like find um, where software updates have caused problems with their application because suddenly they went from you know five login failures an hour to a thousand and they were able to find that the application had broken something in the login process and get that addressed very quickly. So there's a lot of good performance reasons to do this as well. Now, one of the other technologies that we want to talk about here is configuration management. And this might seem like a really obvious one, but even if you're already using configuration management, there are a few key points to making sure that it's part of the security process as well as part of your network and systems monitoring. So the first question to ask is where are those change alerts going? In a lot of cases, they might be just going straight to the network team, um, but maybe they should also be going to the security team. Uh, or what about change management? So this is especially important to watching things like changes to firewall configurations. Now, this sounds obvious as well, but you'd be surprised how often we see this in the field where it's not happening. And sometimes it's just because the security team and the network team aren't communicating well. Uh, but sometimes, um, you know, there are other reasons why it wasn't routed properly and those people aren't seeing it. Um, or the firewall teams don't want their configurations archived by the network management tool because they're afraid someone will get access to that tool and be able to see the configurations. Um, but if you're doing this management properly, 
it can make everyone more aware of when and what is changing in the device configuration and that can save a lot of troubleshooting time when we're dealing with one of these and it can also you know more eyes on it can help to find underlying security issues as well um, you want to pay special attention to when the configuration change alerts are happening. So if you've got predefined and approved change windows, you might want to pay special attention to any kind of configuration changes that are happening outside those, those predefined and approved windows. You should also make sure that you've integrated those alerts directly with the SIEM or your ticketing system. And I'm going to show you some easy ways to do that in a little while here. But the most important thing with configuration management is to make sure that every time a configuration change alert comes in, it's being audited and reviewed against your change control process so that you know that unapproved changes aren't getting made to your infrastructure or firewalls or people aren't going out and making cowboy changes to try to, you know, engineer on the fly. So creating an internal security for your configurations is also kind of a benefit of, of using that configuration management for all of your devices. Now I'm going to do a quick demonstration um, just to show you how you see where configuration alerts are going and make sure they're going to the right teams and in the right format. So if I go over here to uh, my reports, oh, I'm sorry, hang on here. But one second and let me just pull up the correct web browser here. Okay, sorry about that, minor technical problem, go to a different server here. So what I'm gonna to do to check to see where those configuration management rules go is I'm gonna to go to the administration menu and I'm gonna to go to alerts and I'm gonna to go to incident management. Incident management is where we handle all the kind of processing type rules. Um, so when alerts come into the system, you can apply these rules to them to do different things like route them to different places or suppress them if they happen at you know the wrong time of day or the, you know you don't want to send them to a particular team or change the format of the messages so in this case the configuration change alerts rule if i go to edit that rule i can see exactly what's going to happen when i get a configuration change alert in this case it's going to create an incident it's going to send a custom alert um, the configuration manager noticed by email is the is the alert format for that and it's being sent to the network ops center so if i go to edit that i can change exactly what format of message i want to send including custom alert formats and in a bit i'll show you how to change those um, but then i can also go in and change the destination so this can be any of the different action groups that i've configured within the tool as well Okay, so another great place to watch for security issues is in traffic flow data. So we can use the technologies that we've already built into our infrastructure devices, things like NetFlow or IPFix, to gather information about exactly who's talking to whom on the network and what protocols are being used. So then with that data, we can watch for the sudden appearance of new protocols on the network. So this is a great way to keep aware of what's going on in the environment um, and spot when things are happening that are new or unusual. But this can be a little tricky in larger environments because you might have teams deploying new applications on a near constant basis. And if you don't have good change control communication, um, your team might not always know when new applications are supposed to be coming online and when this data is going to be changing. But one of the easy things to do here is to look for spikes in control traffic. Um, these are definitely red flags that something's not right. So this could be a sudden surge in routing updates, uh, ICMP traffic, uh, DNS requests, or even unexpected spikes in VPN traffic, for example. Maybe the remote worker is downloading data to work offline, or maybe he's copying the customer database to sell it to one of your competitors. Either way, it's worth looking into. Now, another way to watch this data that people don't think of from a security perspective is to monitor application response times because um, things like brute force attacks or distributed denial of service attacks can cause your application to slow down. And this data can then be correlated with other server performance metrics to see if the traffic is legitimate or not. 
but this is especially important for cloud hosted systems as you might not have deep access to the server or operating system level information uh, on those hosted applications. So in a lot of hosting environments, We've got no OS visibility, no hardware visibility. All we've got is the application. And so managing the top layer performance is the only real metric we have to work with, um, depending on how we've built that application itself and if we've built in any other instrumentation. But at the highest level, um, you know, this gives us a way to kind of measure the overall performance uh, and then benchmark it over time. Now, cloud providers often build in some level of DDoS protection, but they rarely provide protection against things like brute force or password replay attacks. And you can't control, or even in many cases, see all of the traffic to and from the system. So monitoring this way is a way we can kind of keep track of what's going on in that application. And a sudden change in application response time is concerning both from a performance uh, perspective as well as from a security perspective. So we can use that anomaly detection to watch those response times and let us know if they suddenly change or if they suddenly go into an unacceptable range um, and any kind of rapid or unseasonable change you know it's not good for this time of day not good at this day of the week not good on this day of the month uh, any kind of change from that can be used to indicate something unusual is happening with the application and then we can go in and investigate it deeper Now, once we have all this great data we need to make sure that we're sharing it so by making the data outside uh, the team and to everybody who is in the value stream for the application, everyone shares a common view of reality and that not only aids in communications, it also demonstrates transparency which enhances trust. Big key to making that successful though is to make it easy and quick to access the information so teams don't feel like they need to have their own separate monitoring. That can create a lot of alert noise and redundant effort as well as creating additional admin support and maintenance spend issues. Um, if the audience is non-technical and there's always some non-technical people that need to be kept in the loop, don't hesitate to simplify or abstract the data into easier to understand formats. So one way that we do this is with what we call business workflow views, which allow you to roll an entire application, all of its component parts, everything that we're monitoring for that system into a single percentage score so that people can easily understand whether things are good or bad or whether there's a known problem with any of the different things that we might be monitoring in the environment. You can share that in a number of different ways, um, depending on what's appropriate for your environment. So APIs, common share pages or intranet pages, um, unauthenticated status pages, which you can serve directly out of your Netrio appliance, uh, or information radiators. And an information radiator is really just a system that's designed to display important status information in a public area. For example, a monitor on the wall of a hallway that everybody walks through. So the team can display specific application views or more technical ones, depending on who the audience in that particular area of the building is. But this allows you to keep the teams in sync, not just for status data, um, but also for things like operational metrics, like response time or transaction velocity, in addition to the security visibility. You can also use information radiators to actively demonstrate team values, specifically that the team has nothing to hide from visitors, customers, stakeholders, and has nothing to hide from itself because we acknowledge and confront our problems. And again, that helps to build that trust with the other teams. So one of the things we talked about a lot here is integrating all of this data with your SIEM platform and rolling security alerts from that into your dashboards. So for inbound alerts from the SIEM, this is actually really easy as we provide a very simple web-based API that lets your other systems push alerts directly into our platform and you can display those on custom dashboards or view, integrate them with individual device views um, and really integrate into all the command center operations. Now for outbound messages, things like um, configuration change alerts or anomaly alarms, you have a number of different choices. So you can use things like uh, webhooks and JSON, even email messages, syslog or SNMP traps if that's all the platform can support. So we provide a really simple way to edit the format of those messages. So you can make sure that they're customized into a format that your information management uh, system or your security correlation system can easily process and parse. Um, you can also include a wide variety of information in those messages, including things like documentation information, like serial numbers or asset tags, um, you know, runbook information or instructions about who to contact um, or on-site responsible contact details, addresses, building numbers, all that kind of stuff can be included in the message that we send, which you can then integrate into your ticketing or into your security event management. So it's all in a single place. 
And you can use those incident management rules that we talked about um, to route those alerts. Um, so depending on the type of message, the time of day or the day of week, you can actually route those to different locations if you'd like. So let me just try to show you a couple of quick examples here. Give me just one second here to get this up and running. Okay, here we go. Okay, so well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate how we change the format of these messages. So if I go into alerts, there's an alert formatting option here in the menu. And by going into alert formatting, I can actually go in and modify the format of any of the custom alert templates. Um, so if I want to send a custom message for a specific type of alarm, or I can go and modify any of the default templates that are already in use for things like regular regular monitoring. And by changing the format of these, I can put them into a format that might be easier to parse for my system or change the information that's populated. And there's a huge list of macros provided that I can use to send that information out of the system. I can then also use these via the incident management rules like we talked about before um, to send them you know, to additional teams. Or I can go to actions and use this to format webhook style messages. So if I want to go in, any of those same macros that I can use in an alert, I can also use to populate a JSON call that goes directly into an application and integrates directly in there. So this makes it really easy to make sure all of the relevant information is there for the other tools to use. Um, and if I want to, you know, build in things like automatic trouble ticket notifications, you know, I've got a very simple way that I can do that and make sure that all of those, uh, all of the, the relevant data from my monitoring system is included in that alert. So I don't have to keep going back to the well and digging it up from multiple locations. And that can save a lot of troubleshooting time as well as time to repair. Now, I'd like to take just a moment to talk about who we are for those of you who haven't worked with us before. Uh, Netrio is in the middle of our 20th year, and we've been profitable since year one uh, with a proven track record in both public and private enterprise and a customer retention rate of 98%. We've won monitoring product years and we've led the company years as well. And funded, uh, we did a private equity transaction to gain additional working capital and resources, as well as access to some very experienced business experts, allowing us to grow even faster. So now I'm going to take a few minutes to address any questions that came up during the webinar. So please enter them into the GoToWebinar interface if you haven't already. I'm also going to launch a poll now. So if you'd like us to follow up with additional information or discuss your unique environment, um, you can let us know that way and we'll get in touch with you privately. So the first question is, how is Netrio deployed? Um, so our model is appliance-based, but you can deploy that as an on-premise uh, physical appliance, a virtual appliance, in the cloud, or even as a SaaS solution, depending on what your needs are. So the appliance itself is designed to be completely self-contained, so there's no um, operating system level administration required. There's no external databases to license or secure. It's all designed to be completely self-contained. Uh, and then you can also deploy what we call remote collector appliances or service engines uh, wherever needed. So if you need, for example, to monitor a segmented DMZ or an isolated segment or a remote VPC, um, there's an easy solution to collect that data without having to open up multiple holes through firewalls to make it happen. Uh, the next question, how large an environment does Netrio scale to? So this depends a little bit on the method you use to deploy. A single hardware appliance, for example, can monitor up to 25,000 devices, uh, but you can cluster additional appliances together for basically unlimited scaling. Now, as a virtual appliance, it's going to depend on the virtualization platform you're running it on. It supports, um, you know, Hyper-V and VMware, as well as uh, hyper-converged type solutions. Um, so depending on the platform and environment, um, but we've got customers doing six to 8,000 devices in a virtual appliance pretty easily. And there's also a SaaS option, as I mentioned before. So if you want us to host it in the cloud, um, you can deploy a collector engine on site and run all of the operating system and, and or uh, I'm sorry, the user interface and all of the alerting directly through the cloud. Um, and that works really well in smaller environments or if you just don't wanna have to host the appliance at all. Okay, for questions. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I hope you've learned some useful things uh, about how to improve your security posture using your existing monitoring platforms. Um, so 
if you have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to contact us at info at netrio.com and we'll be sure to get back to you right away. Have a great rest of your day, everyone, and hope to see you again on a webinar soon.